Lord, we've gathered here this morning to give praise to your name. You're worthy of glory and worthy of our gratitude, worthy of our love and our adoration. So we lift up your name in this place today and confess not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name belongs the glory, like the psalmist says. We're so thankful we can gather together and celebrate the salvation that you've provided for us through Christ. We stand on him. It's in Christ alone that our hope is found, and we can come to you with no fear this morning, with no shame this morning, not because of our sinlessness, for our sins are many, but because of his perfect sacrifice, his resurrection. That is where our confidence is found. Such a joy to celebrate that together as brothers and sisters and to consider how the sacrifice of Christ compels us to offer our lives to you as a living sacrifice, like Paul says. And so, Lord, I pray that today as we listen to your word, that you would challenge and confront the unbelief that remains in our hearts. Perhaps there's some here today whose unbelief is strong. It's spiritually terminal. It will lead to judgment if they don't turn to Christ today. I pray that today sinners would hear the gospel and be drawn to Christ and be saved. And Lord, for those of us who know you, we confess there are traces of pride, traces of unbelief that remain. And so we ask that you would overcome those sins in our own hearts with the truth of your word, that we would listen to the voice of Jesus today, that it would grip us, compel us. So Lord, speak to us now through your spirit for the sake of the glory of your name. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Our text this morning will be Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. I invite you to turn there. And we'll read the text before we begin. Luke chapter 14, verses 25 through 35. Luke 14, beginning in verse 25, Luke records, Now great crowds accompanied him, and he turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father... And mother, and wife, and children, and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life. He cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? <clears throat> Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. So therefore, any of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is to be thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. There are many people in the world today, many people in the church today, who actually understand the gospel. They understand the message of Jesus. They agree with what the Bible teaches about sin, about the holiness of God, about the incarnation of Christ. They believe Jesus was God in the flesh, come down from heaven. They agree with the truth that he died on the cross to pay for sin and that he rose from the dead. They believe in heaven and they believe in hell, but they are not disciples of Jesus. They are not his followers. They do not belong to the kingdom of God. How can that be? Because salvation requires more than an intellectual understanding of the gospel. The kind of response that God is looking for, the kind of response the gospel demands is one of repentance and faith, which moves us to yield our will and surrender the loyalties of our hearts It brings forth a radical commitment to Christ. True faith, genuine repentance are evidenced in that kind of response 
to Jesus. Last week, if you remember, we saw in the parable of the great banquet that Jesus is a generous savior. He desires that all would come to the feast. He invites the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. He tells his servants to go out into the highways and into the hedges and compel them to come. He desires that his house would be full, that every seat at the table would be filled. But make no mistake, this does not mean that the bar is being lowered in terms of what is required of those who will answer that call. Jesus' preaching of the gospel comes with sharp edges. It comes with a demand for serious commitment. And this text, Jesus' words this morning, remind us that there is no room for superficial or half-hearted or double-minded disciples. In the parable of the great banquet, in the text right before this, the original guests that were invited to the feast Remember, they declined when the time came to come to the meal. And they all had an excuse, didn't they? Some had property to care for. Others had work that needed to be done. One had some family obligations. They all have reasons for saying no. Luke follows up that parable about the feast by recording this teaching of Jesus on the cost of discipleship. Yes, there are difficult choices to make. But genuine disciples, those who say yes to Christ, are willing to love Christ over all. If you look in verse 25, the setting for the story uh, contains a shift in the audience. Verse 25 says, great crowds are accompanying him. So throughout chapter 14, prior to this, Jesus has been at dinner in the house of a Pharisee on the Sabbath. But now Jesus has resumed his journey to Jerusalem. Chapter 9, 51 tells us that he set his face to go there, to Jerusalem. He's making a beeline now for the cross. And this little anecdote by Luke is not just filler material. It, It flavors the whole passage. Luke wants to remind us that the one who is speaking about the cost of discipleship is himself on his way to lay down his life. He's about to carry his cross and make the ultimate sacrifice. And as Jesus, with his jaw set like a flint, his face is focused on Jerusalem, as he's on his way, he turns, and Luke points this out, he turns and sees the people coming behind them. He sees the crowd, it's, and it's a mix of people, no doubt. Some are casual observers. Some people want to see a miracle, because they've heard the stories. Others maybe are interested in what he has to say. They have an intellectual curiosity about, so what is it that this rabbi is teaching and how does that fit with what rabbi so-and-so teaches? And perhaps others are just entertained by the spectacle. Hey, did you hear about this guy, Jesus? He keeps busting the Pharisees over and over again and they're really getting mad. Maybe they just got their popcorn and they want to see the fight. They want to see what's going to happen next. Others are hopeful that Jesus is heading to Jerusalem to liberate them from the oppression of Rome. No doubt there are others mixed in who are genuine seekers. They long to learn from Jesus. They want to follow him genuinely. Well, Jesus sees the crowd. And just like he saw the hypocrisy and the pride and the presumption of the Pharisees at dinner, Jesus sees in the crowd an issue. He sees a shallow understanding of what many of them had when it comes to what it really means to follow him, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to embrace his teaching about the kingdom, what is required. They're going to believe his message. Jesus knows they need to hear something, and so he tells them. The point this morning is simple, that discipleship requires unreserved devotion to Christ. That's what Jesus calls for. If you're going to believe the gospel, if you're going to come after Jesus and follow him, if you want to belong to him, discipleship requires unreserved devotion to Christ. And just to define what it means to be a disciple real quick, a disciple is not just like a super serious Christian, and then there's these other Christians who aren't disciples. To be a disciple is to be a genuine Christian. It's one and the same. And Jesus says discipleship requires unreserved devotion To Christ. And in what follows, I want to pull out four marks of unreserved devotion to Christ. What does that look like? What does it mean to be devoted to Christ fully, to have an unreserved loyalty to Him over all? We see that in the text that follows. There's three statements Jesus makes 
these conditional clauses that if this is not true of you, then you cannot be my disciple. You see that in verse 26 and verse 27, and again in verse 33. And so the first point, the first mark of this unreserved devotion to Christ is found in verse 26, that first conditional clause. Verse 26, Jesus says, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Number one, unreserved devotion to Christ requires redefining relational loyalties. It requires redefining your relational loyalties. Jesus emphasizes if you do not meet this condition, if you cannot or will not do this, then you cannot be his disciple. And that word cannot is an important word. It signifies power or ability. So when he says you cannot be my disciple, he's not referring to to granting permission. The way that I might say to my son Elijah, you cannot have a cookie. That's giving permission. That's not what Jesus is saying. He's not saying you don't have permission. This is a statement of power or ability. The same way that my son Elijah might say to me, Dad, you cannot dunk a basketball. He's correct. I cannot. I'm 5'11", and I'm turning 40, and I never could, even in high school. So that's a matter of ability, power. So when Jesus says, you cannot be my disciple, he's not saying, I'm not going to give you permission unless you jump through this hoop. He's saying, if you can't say yes to this requirement, you are unable to follow me. You're excluding yourself in that sense. So what is the condition that Jesus gives? If you cannot do what? He says, if any man comes to me and does not hate. This is a famous statement and a difficult one. What does it mean to hate? To hate your father and mother, the people who brought you into the world, who care for you, who provided for your needs, who gave you your name and your life, the people that you owe everything to. What does it mean to hate them? What does it mean to hate your wife? Bone of your bone, flesh of your flesh. And we've got some newlyweds here today. That's a tough statement. What's it mean to hate your wife? What does it mean to hate your children? Your offspring, the, the, the people who you brought into the world that carry on your name and your legacy, the people that you would die for and give everything for who depend on you for life. What does it mean to hate your brothers and sisters, those who walk with you on the journey of life, the people that have your back? What does it mean to hate your own life? This is an important statement. And we have to ask the question, how does this statement harmonize with the goodness of God's design for marriage, his design for the family? How does this statement of Jesus harmonize with his commands regarding our most precious earthly relationships? Remember Exodus 20, verse 12 in the Ten Commandments, honor your father and mother. How does that fit with hate your father and mother? Ephesians 5.25 says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The ultimate love, the pure love, sacrificial love. How does this fit with Paul's counsel to Titus? In Titus chapter 2, where he tells the older women to teach the younger women to love their husbands and children. They're to be taught to do that. Is Jesus revoking the fifth commandment, honor your father and mother? Is he rejecting the wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs 5 who urges young men to delight yourself in the wife of your youth and to be intoxicated with her love in Song of Solomon? Is he rejecting that wisdom? Is he calling us to treat marriage, which Paul teaches us in Ephesians 5, is a picture of the gospel? Is he saying that picture is worthless? No. So we need to dig deeper. And it's helpful here to note that, that this phrase, when Jesus uses the word hate, it, it has a very Jewish flavor. It's, it's a Hebraism. It's picking up something that in their culture had a context. It had a history. And as we go back to the Old Testament, I think it helps us to understand what Jesus is saying. In Genesis chapter 29, there's a story about a man named Jacob. It was Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the third in that line of patriarchs. He's the one who was, had his name changed to Israel. He's the father of the nation. And Jacob, which is not wise or ideal, but it happened, Jacob had two wives. And in Genesis 29, 30, it says, So Jacob went into Rachel also, and he loved Rachel more than Leah. 
and served Laban for another seven years. When the Lord saw that Leah was hated, he opened her womb, but Rachel was barren. Perhaps you guys know the story. There's these two sisters, and Jacob desperately wants to marry the younger. He wants to marry Rachel. She was beautiful. He was in love. Laban says, if you work seven years for me, you can marry her. So he works seven years, and then Laban pulls a switcheroo. He actually gives uh, Leah, the older sister, to be married. Her face is covered with a veil. He doesn't know until the marriage is consummated. And then later, he is also given Rachel as a wife. And Moses records that he loved Rachel more than Leah. And then it says, the Lord saw that Leah was hated. So when we go back to that context, we ask the question, does hate mean to despise? Does hate mean that you harbor this sense of malice and disgust towards that person? Does it mean to utterly reject them? No, it means a lesser degree of love. Jacob loved Rachel more than he loved Leah, which means he did love Leah to a degree. Not as much as Rachel, not as much as even he should have. But he did love her to a degree. There's still a measure of love. For example, Jacob had children with Leah. Those children are recorded in Genesis 29. That's not the mark of someone who despises, hates, and rejects a person Jacob was protective of Leah. In fact, he put her and all her children behind the herds and behind the servants in his entourage as he came back home to meet his brother Esau. He was worried about what might happen to them, and he wanted to protect them. Jacob gave Leah an honorable burial. In Genesis 49, he buries Leah, his wife, in the same tomb with Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Rebekah, this cave that was in a field that had been purchased. It was a sacred place of burial and a high honor to be buried there with the patriarchal family. So Jacob did not have disdain for Leah. It's not that he totally rejected her. It's that she was in second place. He loved her less, which probably felt like hate to Leah. To be loved less than her sister, Rachel. We see the same language with reference to God's sovereign choice of Jacob over Esau. In Romans chapter nine, verse 13, Paul quotes from the book of Malachi, referring to the words of God when he said, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. And contextually there, he's talking about his choice to give the promise of the covenant to Jacob, to continue his redemptive work through Jacob and build the nation Israel out of him and to not choose to include Esau in that family line, in in the line of promise. So this adds an element of not just preference, not just loving more one than the other. It adds this element of covenant loyalty. There is a loyalty and a commitment and a promise that God makes to Jacob that he does not make to Esau. Esau was passed over. God would not show the same kind of loyalty to Esau. But this doesn't mean that God despised Esau. It does not mean that he had malice or disgust towards Esau, this emotional revulsion of, oh, I can't stand that guy. Because actually God does bless Esau. He was prosperous. He was the father of a great nation, the father of the nation Edom. And Esau's posterity is recorded for us in Genesis 36. It's actually an expression of God's faithfulness to Abraham. He told Abraham he would be the father of many nations, plural. And he kept that promise. He blessed Esau and made a great nation out of him. But that nation was not the chosen nation. That nation was not Israel. They would, that nation would not receive the law or the prophets, the, the prophets or the Messiah. Yeah, that would come through Israel. So God's hatred of Esau refers here to choosing commitment to one and not the other. It's covenant loyalty. So when we read read those other passages, and then we come back to the words of Jesus, we ask, what is Jesus saying? Very simply put, he is saying we must love all others less than than Jesus. We must love Christ more than father and mother, wife and children, brother and sister. Our highest commitment, our highest loyalty must be to Christ and Christ alone. We say yes to him over all others. So the application here for us is not that, we, not that you need to go home and say, you know what, my, my resolution for this next year is to start loving my family less. That's not actually the application. The answer is to start loving Christ more. It's that Jesus needs to be elevated, to be exalted, to be supreme over all of those other loves. 
If we refuse that choice, if we withhold that loyalty from Christ, Jesus says, you're refusing then to be my disciple. You ask the question, why? Why must Jesus be first? Why should he be first? Well, the reasons are endless. He's the son of God, which means he is worthy. He's deserving of being first place. It would be wrong. It would be a dishonor to him. It would be an insult to him to place him beneath anyone else, even the most precious human relationships we have in this world. He is worthy and deserving of our highest loyalty and love. He alone is Savior. Your spouse can't save you. Your children can't save you. Your parents can't save you. But Jesus can. That's why he must be first. He is the way to God. He reveals God to us. He's the one who reconciles us to God through his death on the cross. He is the way and the truth and the life. He's the incarnate word of God, God's revelation of himself to us. In short, Christ must be supreme in our hearts because of who he is and because of what he does and because of what we need. Jesus must be first. So if it ever comes down to a choice between pleasing Christ and pleasing someone else that we love, a choice between serving Christ or maintaining a relationship with a family member, if it comes down to a choice of loyalty to the truth of Christ, or the acceptance of a family member. We must choose Christ. And for some, this is going to be costly. It means that some parents will not be able to affirm the lifestyle choices of their adult children. Some of you live there. It means some husbands will have to lead in ways that disappoint or even anger their wives because their loyalty is to Christ. And they're most concerned with pleasing him, even more than with pleasing their spouse. It means that some young adults will need to make choices that their parents will not understand and their parents will not support because their highest loyalty is to Christ. You have to make a decision. Who are you going to offend when push comes to shove? Who are you going to say yes and no to? Jesus says, if it's not me that gets your yes, If it's not me that has your highest loyalty, if it's not me that has your highest love, then you cannot be my disciple. Those in Jesus' day risked losing their family entirely. To follow Christ would mean breaking with the religious establishment, which risked getting you kicked out of the synagogue, getting blacklisted economically, getting isolated socially. And in that culture, shame and honor was a huge deal. To bring dishonor to yourself and to the name of your family was one of the worst things that could happen. The same is true today for those in Muslim countries. If you come to Christ and you say yes to him, you're saying no to all the people in your life. The same is true for those in communist countries today. There is a cost to following Jesus. And that cost is growing in our own culture. As fidelity to Christ means rejecting the morals and the values of our day, If you say yes to Jesus, it means you're going to be on the receiving end of the anger and the rejection of those who have a religious zeal for progressive ideology, a religious fervor in support of abortion and transgenderism, homosexuality, those who have a religious zeal for feminism and and the rejection of God's roles for men and women in the home and in the church and in the world. If you say yes to Jesus, you're going to anger and upset and offend many in our culture. Historically, the United States has enjoyed the great blessing of religious freedom. We're seeing the social pressure increase. With that social pressure will come other pressures. But Jesus says, if you won't redefine your loyalties and place me over all, even your own family, you cannot be my disciple. I should clarify, it's not all bad news. Following Jesus, thank the Lord, doesn't always wreck your family. And we can rejoice in that. There's some of you who are here today as representatives of the only believer in your family. But there's some of you that are here today with your family. And you're all believers. Ironically, it's your ultimate loyalty to Christ that actually makes you a better father. It's your loyalty to Christ, your love for him, that makes you a better husband, a better wife, a better mother, a better son or daughter or brother or sister. Because you know what Christ teaches us to do? He teaches us to honor and to love and to serve. 
Because Christ calls us to humility. Because Christ, when we give our ultimate loyalty to him, he shapes us with the truth and makes us fruitful and holy and more like him. So be encouraged. There there is blessing that often comes. It's not always sacrifice. And in fact, God may even use your loyalty to Christ, your supreme love for Jesus in your home to actually bring others in your family to salvation, to stir weak faith into strong devotion. Jesus himself experienced this. His brothers did not believe in him. They were embarrassed by him. They tried to get him to quiet down. They were frustrated. But after the resurrection, they believed. For some, that that may be your experience. That your commitment to Christ now, your obedience to him now, may at first bring friction in your home, but God may use that later to bring about someone's salvation. So it's not always bad news. It's not always doom and gloom. God will use our loyalty to him, our love for him, to potentially have a sanctifying effect in our own home and our family. But the ultimate reason we must define our relational, redefine our relational loyalties is, is not because of what we may gain in this world or how God may use it. Really, the ultimate reason is because only Jesus can save. As we saw back in Luke chapter 9, whoever would save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? You see, you have to make a choice. Do you want the acceptance of your family or the acceptance of Christ? If you lose the acceptance of your family, in order to receive the acceptance of Christ, Jesus promises you that it's worth it. You save your soul. If you say no to Jesus, to try to preserve or maintain something with a spouse, with a child, with a parent, you risk losing eternity. Jesus says, unreserved devotion to me requires redefining your relational loyalties. There's a second mark of unreserved devotion to Christ. Unreserved devotion to Christ, number two, requires embracing self-denial. Embracing self-denial. Look at the end of verse 26 there. It's not just saying no to other people. Father, mother, wife, children, brothers and sisters. Jesus adds this, yes, and even his own life. He expounds on that in verse 27. Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. It's not just other people that you might have to say no to. The hardest person to say no to is yourself. But Jesus says you have to hate your own life, not meaning that you're miserable and depressed and that you want to die. When he says hate your own life, he's saying that you say no to yourself to say yes to Christ. The cross was a symbol of humiliation. The cross was a symbol of suffering and death. Jesus says, that you cannot be my disciple unless, verse 27, you bear your own cross and come after me. This is more than just the entry point to discipleship. This is the ongoing manner of life for those who follow Jesus. Jesus will soon carry his cross to the place of the school and he would be crucified there, not against his will. He didn't go kicking and screaming. He was willing. He laid down his life. He was obedient to the Father. And Jesus says this same kind of self-denial, this same kind of willing sacrifice, this same kind of of obedience is required of those who would follow me. He's not meaning that you take up your cross to somehow atone for your own sin. Only Jesus does that. Only his cross saves you. But we must be willing to deny ourselves to the fullest degree and take up our cross, recognizing self-denial and personal sacrifice will be required of us if we would follow Jesus. And this is hard for us because it goes directly against everything that's natural in our flesh, doesn't it? We all have this instinct to preserve self, to promote self, to care for self, to serve ourself. We want to be in control of our own life. We want to be in control of our situation. We want to control our circumstances and manage it for ourselves and for our own purposes. And Jesus says, that part of you has to die. That part of you has to die. But here's the beautiful thing. When we deny ourselves, we are accepted by Christ. When we embrace loss, we receive his reward. When we embrace suffering, 
We are promised his eternal comfort. When we relinquish control over our life, we come under the gracious rule of King Jesus. When we lose everything in the world, we gain Christ and everything in him. So the bottom line is there is a cost to following Jesus. It's going to cost you your earthly loyalties and it's going to cost you your own self, your own autonomy. Jesus says we need to count that cost to think deeply and honestly about what's required of those who follow him. And he gives two illustrations of this. And the first is in verse 28 through 30. He gives this sort of individual agricultural illustration about a building project. He says, which of you desiring to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Jesus says, imagine that you need a storage site on your farm. You're going to build a tower, a silo, right? Or maybe you need a lookout tower on your wall where you can keep an eye on your herds. In either case, Jesus says, nobody would think of starting a project like that without first figuring out ahead of time, how much is it going to cost you? How much is it going to cost you in time and materials? And do you have what it takes to complete the project? Now, in our culture, because we prize economic factors over almost everything, right? The big bummer in a situation like that for us would be, oh, it's, it's, I, it's a lost investment. I wasted money. But in that culture, again, honor and shame were the things that were much more significant even than your bottom line. And so for a highly visible structure like a tower, something that everyone would see as they walk by, to not be able to finish that would be broadcasting your failure to everybody, resulting in mockery. People pointing out, wow, you really couldn't follow through, could you? You didn't think about that before you started, did you? You got in over your head, didn't you? It would have brought shame to them. He gives a second illustration about counting the cost in verses 31 through 32. This time it's a political, military image. He says, What king going out to encounter another king in war will not sit down first and deliberate whether he's able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for terms of peace. This math is a little different. Jesus now paints a picture where you're not just measuring time and materials. Now you're measuring manpower and weapons and, and the terrain and what is at stake is a lot more serious than just getting laughed at by your neighbors. It's a matter of life and death. The legacy of your kingdom is at stake. And a wise king, Jesus says, is obviously going to be calculating, not reckless. He's going, going to be realistic, not idealistic. He's going to be honest about the risks. He's not going to be naive. He will enter into a situation like that with his eyes wide open, well aware of what is at stake and what the cost will be. And you know what? If the king knows he can't meet his enemy on the battlefield, if he knows he's outmatched and he's going to lose if he tries, he'll resort to plan B. He'll go and negotiate for peace. He'll be proactive about doing what he can. We'll either fight or we'll talk, but one way or another, we have to preserve life and preserve the kingdom and preserve my legacy. If the first illustration teaches us that we need to ask the question, can I afford to follow Jesus? I think the second illustration teaches us we need to ask, can I afford not to? Because there's a lot at stake. Yes, there is a great cost to following Jesus. But there's a greater cost to not following him. And when you start to do the math, when you start to realize it is worth it and that it's necessary, then you say, I will deny myself and take up my cross and follow Jesus because I counted the cost. I know what's at stake. I know how hard it's going to be, but I also know that it's worth it. Jesus encourages us to count the cost. Again, he's not hiding any of the details. Jesus isn't like that guy trying to sell you a timeshare where there's fine print you don't find out about until after you signed up. No, he tells you everything up front, says, here's what it costs. Redefine all your relational loyalties and take up your cross, deny yourself. Embrace personal sacrifice. Lay down your life. And if you won't, then you cannot follow me. He wants us to know that following him is not some emotional decision. 
It's not an impulse decision. It's not something done to please a parent or a friend or a pastor. It's not some cautious decision that, you know what, I'm going to test drive Christianity for a while and kind of see if it works for me. No, Jesus says it's a wholehearted self-denial that has counted the cost and determined with a grace-given wisdom that it is worth it. It is worth it. Unreserved devotion to Christ requires that we embrace personal sacrifice and self-denial. There's a third mark that Jesus gives us. It's in verse 33. Unreserved devotion to Christ, number three, requires renouncing earthly possessions. Renouncing earthly possessions. Verse 33, so therefore, any one of you who does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. There's a third time Jesus drills home this phrase. If you won't do this, you cannot be my disciple. Now, why does Jesus have to say this? That we must renounce all that we have. Well, he has to say this because we love our stuff. We do. We love our stuff. We get attached to our houses, our cars, our tools, our toys, our wardrobe, our gadgets. And our attachment to our stuff can be a spiritual millstone around our neck if we're not careful. It might keep us from following Jesus. In Luke 16, Jesus says, No servant can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. It's an either or. And if your heart is tethered to your stuff, Jesus says, you cannot follow me. A disciple must be attached to Jesus, not attached to our stuff. So he says we have to renounce all we have. And you say, well, what does that mean? Renounce here means to sever the bonds of trust. It means to renounce your rights over your stuff, to renounce your claim on your possessions, and to hold all of it with open hands. Open hands. It doesn't mean necessarily that you have to get rid of everything, but it does mean that you must be willing to, if that's what Christ requires. Some people will be called to give up their material possessions, perhaps to meet a need for someone else, perhaps to put to death their own idolatry, We'll meet a man in chapter 18 who loved his stuff, who thought he was keeping the law, and Jesus gave him a test. He said, go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then come and follow me. And he couldn't. Jesus wasn't teaching that everyone has to sell everything they have. He was saying, whatever your idol is, you need to put it to death. Some people may be required to divest themselves because they worship what they have. Some people will give up the things they own in order to move to the mission field or in order to go and help plant a church somewhere. But there's going to be other people who aren't required to give up everything they have. Listen to 2 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17 and 18. Paul tells Timothy, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. There are many in the room today, all of us by the world's standards, if you go internationally around the world, we are wealthy. So what does God call us to do? Does Jesus say, get rid of it all and become poor? No, he says, renounce it. Deny your loyalty. Say, that isn't what I need. That isn't who I am. That isn't what I'm trusting in. That's not what I love the most. And my hands are open. If the Lord has use for it, it can pass out of my hands in a heartbeat. I'm not going to cling to those things. We're not to set our hopes on the uncertainty of riches, Paul says. We set our hopes on God. And by the way, God is the one who gave us all that. And he gave us these things to enjoy them. It's not wrong to enjoy what we have. But the one who loves Christ the most will not just enjoy the material gifts God provides. He'll also enjoy giving those things away. He'll enjoy using them to further Christ's glory in his kingdom. So the real question is not whether you have many possessions. It's whether your many possessions have you. That's what Jesus is getting after. This is about the attitude of the disciple more than the inventory of the disciple. 
A disciple is not marked by how much he owns, but rather his attitude towards what he owns. It's not more holy to be poor than to be rich. Materialism is a sin that infects the hearts of people at every socioeconomic level. Poor people can be materialists and love money, worship money, just as much as rich people. What you fear, what you trust, what you value, what you want, we find that at every level. So it's the heart, not the having, that Jesus is concerned about here. So you might ask the question, how can I tell if my possessions, if my wealth has a grip on me? Because I don't want to fall short of what Christ calls me to. Maybe you're going, okay, Lord, what, what would you, uh, how do I understand where my heart is today? Well, he, here's the thing. God is going to give you some very real tests that will show you. God will show you. Real tests will come when you get more when you get maybe that inheritance check from a family member, what is your attitude about that? What is your heart towards that? Oh, this is what we've needed. Finally, now we can do those things we've been wanting to do. Pay off the house, go on vacation, upgrade the car, put away something for retirement, pay for our kids' college. Is it all about you? Is it, oh man, why did he give my cousin more than me? Is there anger? Is there jealousy? Whenever you get more, There's going to be a test. What's your heart? What's your attitude towards that? There's also going to be a test when you lose, when the transmission goes out, when your property taxes go up, and they will. What emotion does that elicit from the heart? What happens when your business fails? What happens when everything you invested in, that the market drops out and all goes away? That will be a test to say, where's your heart? Have you renounced everything you have? Are you clinging to it, needing it, trusting it, worshiping it? You'll also be tested when other people around you are more blessed than you are. You pull into church and your muffler is rattling. A few pieces of rust fall off, you know, to kind of mark where you've been. And you look at that really nice new truck in the spot next to you. That will be a test. Can you be happy for that, brother? You'll be tested when others around you are in need. Wow, that person's really struggling. I hope they can figure it out. Or is your first impulse to say, well, I've renounced all I have, so if there's something I have that can meet that need, I'm ready and willing to do it. You'll be tested when you come to worship, when there's an opportunity to give to the Lord through the ministry of the church. Your offerings, your tithes in the church will not be measured by God on the amount It'll be measured by the degree and by the heart of sacrifice that it represents. Jesus elsewhere tells a story about a widow who comes and puts in these two little coins. and They're almost worthless. But he said she gave more than everyone else because she gave not out of her abundance, but out of her lack. Those will be the tests. So how do you respond when you get, when you lose, when someone else thrives, when someone else has a need, when you come to worship? What is your heart, your attitude towards what you possess? Jesus says, therefore, if any one of you does not renounce all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. There's a fourth and final mark. It's in verse 34 through 35. Finally, unreserved devotion to Christ results in being useful to Christ. It results in being useful to Christ. Jesus says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is of no use either for the soil or for the manure pile. It is to be thrown away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. There's a word in the original language that's not been translated in the ESV that I'm preaching out of this morning. Some of you, if you have another version of the Bible, may see that verse 34 starts with the word therefore. Therefore. And that's an important Detail because it links this statement about salt to all the other things that came before. So Jesus isn't changing the subject. He's not introducing a new idea. He said, I was talking about the cost of discipleship. Now I'm saying something else about salt. No, he, this is connected. He's actually concluding his teaching on the cost of discipleship. And he does so by giving us one more real life illustration, an illustration about salt, which was very valuable in Jesus's day. It was valuable, not just as a seasoning, but as a preservative. If you don't have a freezer, if you don't have a refrigerator, meat, fish, those things can be preserved by salting them. And then it could be stored for longer periods of time. 
Salt was also used for the people of Israel. It had a religious function. It was connected with certain sacrifices and associated with God's covenant. You, you can read that in Leviticus. It talks about the salt of my covenant. So what does Jesus mean, salt that loses its taste? Yes, we know salt is good. It's religious uses and, and you know, uses in the kitchen and things like that. But how can salt lose its taste? If, if you remember your chemistry class, sodium chloride doesn't lose its taste. It's sodium chloride. That's what it is. It's salt. But the salt that they used in that day wasn't always pure. Down around the Dead Sea, where it's a high concentration of salt and other minerals in that body of water, on the edge where it evaporates, there's all these salt crystals, and they would sort of harvest that. But sometimes those deposits were impure. It had other things mixed in, gypsum and other things. And so if you got a batch of these crystals that were supposedly salty, and maybe it had some salt in part of it or maybe on the surface, and as you're using it, eventually you're like, hey, this isn't salty anymore. It means you got a bad batch, and that salt wasn't actually salt, which means it wasn't actually good for anything, so you throw it out. It has no use in the soil for treating and changing the, the pH of the soil. It has no use on the manure pile to you know, keep certain things from decomposing and smelling, so you just get rid of it. You throw it away. This language of throwing it out, I think, is a somber echo of what Jesus said just a few verses before this at the end of chapter 13 and verse 28. Remember what Jesus was saying? As he talks about the final judgment, he says, in that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out, thrown out. Jesus here says salt is good, but if there's no more saltiness in it, it gets thrown out. It gets cast out. What does that have to do with discipleship? Very simply this, radical devotion to Jesus. If you're going to redefine your relational loyalties, if you're going to to embrace personal sacrifice, radical self-denial, if you're going to renounce all your possessions, that's going to make you different. It's going to make you salty. And it's going to make you useful. Just like salt has many uses and was valuable, a disciple of Jesus who's committed to Christ overall becomes greatly useful to Christ, useful in his kingdom. Jesus uses people like this. But without devotion to Christ, you're just like everybody else, entangled in worldly relationships, distracted by worldly endeavors, focused on earthly possessions, therefore unable to follow Christ and useless to him. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are salt, Jesus says. You might say, does this really happen to the church? It can. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 15, Jesus says to a church, to a body of people who claim to be disciples, a group of people who claim to worship Christ and believe the gospel. He says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either cold or hot, but because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, because you're useless, I will spit you out of my mouth. That's a sober word of warning from Jesus Christ to the church. Jesus concludes his teaching here in Luke with a sober admonition to take his word seriously, to take it to heart. He says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. He says, you better sit up and pay attention to what I'm telling you today. We need to examine our own hearts. Is there devotion to Christ overall? Is that present or is it lacking? Consider your own entanglement in earthly relationships. Is Christ first? Consider your relationship to your earthly possessions. Have you renounced them? Or do they have a hold on your heart? Consider your willingness to deny yourself, (coughs) to bear your own cross as you follow after Jesus. Are you a disciple of Jesus? Listen, we don't get to define the terms of discipleship. Jesus does. And he does so very clearly here. 
And I think the reason he has to offer these three statements about the cost of discipleship, the warning about useless salt, is because we will be tempted to fear man, to want human approval. We will be tempted to preserve ourselves. We'll be tempted to serve our own interests, to want to control our own situation and our own circumstances, our own life. We'll be tempted to trust in our possessions, to look for our joy, our happiness, our security in our bank account or in our material goods. Let me ask you, is it possible that those things have a claim on your heart and that they might be keeping you from following Jesus? Might they even be keeping you from salvation? Ask yourself this morning, is there anything in your life that is off limits to God? Anything that if he wanted to take it from you, you would say, no, you can have this, 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 and this, but you can't have this. Is there anything you're unwilling to give up? Anything that enjoys first place in your priorities, your affections, your commitment? Maybe it's relationship with kids. Maybe it's a relationship with a boyfriend or a girlfriend that you hope to marry. Maybe it's the approval of a spouse or a parent. Do you crave their acceptance? Do you fear their disapproval to the degree that it might keep you from obeying Christ and following Christ? Maybe it's your career plans, your financial resources, your material goods. You say, yes, I'd like to follow Jesus. I'm interested in, in being a disciple of Jesus, but I also want to still pursue this, and I'm not willing to give up that. Maybe you say, of course not. I think Jesus is first in my life. Well, let me ask you, does Jesus show up in your priorities? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. We need to take this seriously. Is Christ first? Is he actually first? Do you love the person of Christ? Jesus is not an idea. He is a person, divine person, but a person nonetheless. Is Christ your first love? Do you seek to know him? Do you seek to honor him? Do you seek to become like him? Do you love his word? Yes, Jesus is first, but I don't really care what he says. I don't spend any time there. I'm not that concerned with understanding it. It's somebody else's job to study it. Do you love his word? Do you love Christ? Do you love his people? These people, these imperfect, growing, messy, sometimes difficult people. You cannot say, I really love Jesus, but I can't stand his wife. I really love Jesus, and I know he laid down his life for the church, but I try to spend as least amount of time with those people as I can. The love of Christ will be reflected in your love for the church. Do you love his gospel? Do you love his mission? Are you eager to tell others about what Christ has done? Listen, if Jesus is first over all, then his priorities, his purposes, and his people will become your priorities, your purposes, your people. Listen, there's a real danger today of following into a superficial kind of Christianity, the kind that is respectable theologically. It gets it right on paper, but the kind of Christianity that is comfortable, it's not costly, it's never inconvenient. Such nominal Christianity occasionally gives when it's convenient, occasionally volunteers to serve when it's convenient, but only on your own terms, only at your own convenience. There's little cross-bearing in that kind of Christianity, little risk to share the gospel with someone who might reject you. This text leaves us with no choice but to acknowledge true, Christ, true Christianity. Listen, true Christianity, being a disciple of Jesus, it's more than just a worldview. It's more than a moral code of behavior. It, it's more than a political construct. It's more than <clears throat> personal convictions about things. It's more than your religious practice and traditions. It is nothing less than radical devotion to Jesus Christ overall with no reserve Nothing held back. <clears throat> Listen, the Savior who calls us to this kind of sacrifice. Remember what he's doing when he says these words. He's on his way to Jerusalem. He's going to the cross. This Jesus who calls us to sacrifice has made for us the greatest sacrifice. So no matter how much we lose, no matter how much we suffer, no matter how much we give up, nothing will ever compare to the sacrifice that he has made, what he has given up to bring eternal life to us and eternal glory to his father. 
And because of his sacrifice, the good news for us is that whatever we lose on this earth becomes eternal gain as we enter his eternal kingdom, as we receive the eternal life that he died to purchase for us. So as you hear this call to radical discipleship, keep in mind the good news, the gospel of Christ, that our our salvation ultimately is secured not by what we give up, rather by what he gave up. It's not the cross we bear that saves us. It's the cross he bore. Our response of sacrifice and faith and surrender and bearing our cross is simply our response of worship to the one who laid down his life for us. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray that those in the room this morning who are not your disciples would understand the cost, the cost of following you and also the cost of not following you. I pray they would understand the depth of your sacrifice on the cross and the infinitely valuable salvation, the life that you died to purchase with your blood. I pray that they would say yes to the call of Christ, that they would recognize that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. May they repent of sin, renounce self and this world, and say yes to Christ, trust in him, follow him. Lord, for those of us who do belong to you, I pray that you would help us to understand what it means to be a disciple, that we would grow in our love for you, our loyalty to you. May we be faithful to say yes, to obey you, to seek you and to serve you. Lord, may we be a church that is salty and useful in your hands, a group of disciples who are devoted to Christ overall. We pray that you bring this about, Lord, for your glory. Amen.